Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So this is our June general meeting. Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Marco Cuevas. I am the chair of the Westside Community Council. Uh, we have wonderful board uh, here tonight. Uh, Pete's over here taking notes. The secretary, Helen in the back on Zoom. Uh, Maria, somewhere, saw her in the back over there. Uh, Francisco, if I missed any of our board members, some of the, oh, Ron over there, our Revite Chair, Kay, our treasurer. Um, yeah, a couple other of our board members that aren't here right now, but uh, we have Spanish in the back, interpretation if anyone needs it. I'm gonna invite our vice chair, uh, Figueroa, to come up and do an invite to membership. Good evening, everyone. Oh, if you live here, you working here, or you had the business in the Ventura Avenue, you can be the member for the WCC. The, it's easy, just fill out the form, and any donation is welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, and before we get started with standing reports, I just want to mention, I know, um, we have various ways that you can watch. Obviously, we have in-person, we have Zoom, we also have YouTube. So if you know anyone uh, that can benefit from the information tonight or in general from all our meetings and they can't attend these meetings, send them our YouTube link, send them to our website where we have the link to our YouTube, uh, tell them to subscribe, uh, watch this meeting after the fact. Uh, so there's plenty of ways to get the information that we're sharing if you can't make it tonight. Uh, first up, we have our patrol watch. Uh, Commander Hurd couldn't make it tonight, but we have Sergeant Kelly filling in, so go ahead and let him speak on that. Hi. Actually, it was supposed to be Officer Anderson. We thought it would be a cool idea to maybe get one of the officers who works this area their entire existence to come, but um, we got in a foot pursuit of someone downtown, he and I, and he got a concussion. So, he couldn't make it. That was about an hour ago. He's going to be all right, um, but that's why I'm here. So, <clears throat> Amy, hi. I recognize some faces. I don't know if any of you remember me, but I was an acting commander for a while, and I, when we were doing Zoom during COVID, I was doing all the, all the presentations, but it's good to be back out here and say hi to you guys. So, I have the crime stats. Um, there's some copies of them in the back should you want to grab one. There's a few things of interest and what always kind of captures me when I look at these things or when I consider what's going on in the neighborhood I live in is assaults. I'm always worried, what are these assaults? Is my daughter or my wife going to be walking down the street and get assaulted? And when I reviewed those assaults, all but one were domestic violence. So, you know, that is a form of assault. It's sad that it happens, but it's happening in, in private. So, if you're worried about walking down the street, we're not having a lot of things that would be concerning there. Uh, sadly, it's, it is happening in the home, but um, a lot of it's at the misdemeanor level. We also have a robbery that was listed, two of them, and it was over a bicycle where one person thought that another person stole a bicycle and they tried to steal it back when in fact it wasn't actually their bicycle. So whenever you take something uh, from somebody using force, if you came up and ripped my pen out of my hand, that would technically be, could be a robbery. So it didn't involve weapons or, or anything like that. Uh, I am happy to report that although we have four overdoses, none of them were fatal. If you don't know, every single one of us carries Narcan in our car. And oftentimes we can get there as fast or faster than the fire trucks because we're already out there. Um, so we're always racing to get to those calls, racing our friends at the fire department. That wasn't me, right? I did not move. I flinched, but I didn't move. Uh, and, and you know, all the officers are trained on how to do that. So we bring all these people back and then we try and get them into services. And we always, on every single overdose, we do a full investigation that goes all the way to detectives. We get cell phone information. We do interviews trying to find out where these drugs are coming from because we're getting to a point where, for those of you unfamiliar with fent like all these overdoses, I can't guarantee. I can almost guarantee you are fentanyl, right? So super dangerous drug. It used to be being mixed in things, but now people seek that out specifically. So we want to keep that out of our community, uh, off our streets and, and keep our vulnerable population from taking it. So we do investigate all those and uh, 
fortunately, none of these ones resulted in a death. Uh, of note, there's also an animal cruelty. I don't know why I like talking about those ones with people, but there's something about children and animals that uh, all crimes where there's a victim upset me, but they have a particular place in like my heart because they can't talk to you. They can't say, hey, I need help. Hey, this person's hurting me. Uh, so we did have a case where someone lost their temper and started kicking a, a dog and we caught that person and we arrested them. And, and, and uh, so that should stop and the dog was okay. Other than that, I feel like sometimes it's a good opportunity to just, if you have any questions of, of me, I've worked here 24 years. Most of my experience as an officer was downtown and uh, along Ventura Avenue. And I have to admit, and, and I, right now I'm assigned to the other end of town, but this is absolutely my favorite community to work in. I think you can always see an immediate return on your investment in people, whether it's accountability or offering them a hand up. So I've always really enjoyed that. And uh, so if there's any questions, then I'll have an, kind of an exciting announcement for you. I think it's exciting. There's, there's one speaker on Zoom and Trevor, if you're ready, you can uh, ask your question. Yes. Um, hi, guys. All right. I'm trying to turn on my video so you can see me. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but that's OK. Everybody knows me. I'm the bearded monster that walks around with the white shepherd. And, I, you know, I, I see I just had a quick look at your um, what you displayed. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, in the bathroom. And this is being recorded. So I um um, I have to apologize for that, but my question really is: um, I walk this this dog walks me because he's teaching me. You say they don't talk to us, but they do. Uh, we just need to be a little bit more aware of or cognizant, and this is what I call respect. Ultimately, um, acknowledging, you know, you we see the actions. We saw you saw the kicking. They saw or whoever called um, we saw that action. I walk around with this dog 24-7, pretty much. He's with me. He's by my side. He's my partner. and But he's got a yen for the tacos on Stanley, just off Stanley, just on De Anza, in the corner of De Anza. And I, the other night, I saw there was a gentleman, a young man, that was incredibly sketchy. He, I had to look him in the eye once, but I just did not want to. And um, But about 10 minutes later, there were – a cop car that just whizzed up and did a full U-turn and came and stopped. And um, we were all very happy that somebody had been aware that there's somebody in the neighborhood. And I don't know, I don't see it on, on this um, chart, but it was just three days ago, four days ago. So I don't know how far this uh, report goes or where, where it ends, if it ends in um, this week. But um, but really, you know, the, my point ultimately gets down to walking with the dogs because one of the things I believe, and I, that's humane in the sense, in the in the deepest sense, and that's most respectful, the leashes are dangerous things, and we know if we keep them in check, we keep them in check, and we all know how difficult it is to be a hundred percent in check constantly. We need to be ourselves, relaxed. We need to know how to trust each other. And that's, you know, and looking each other in the eye, recognizing and having the courage to ask if necessary, having the courage to, if, to resist, but with a loving, knowing the truth, that knowing that you're in the right, that you believe yourself in the right and how to, how to just yeah, a guy like me must keep quiet and just stand there. And thankfully, I'm with a dog that is will bark at anybody that has ill intent, anybody or anybody who's hiding something, whether they it's ill intended or not. If they're hiding something, um, this is what they do. So I'd like, while I'm talking on this, going off on this thing, I really would like everybody to appreciate that every creature, all creatures, all the growing creatures, all the wild creatures, us talking beings, we all feel, we all can communicate. And the key is to acknowledge it, is to acknowledge it and to appreciate it, acknowledge it and appreciate it. Everything, even those worst of the worst actions that we see, we come across has a root somewhere, 
some way we got to get to that root of it. And the only way we can do it properly, I believe, is with love is to do it knowing this is a nasty thing. Look them in the eye. Look the rat in the eye and know you are smart. You are sneaky, but do not start eating behind my back. I will feed you. That type of a thing where the rat eventually becomes your pet, somebody who communicates, you can trust. You know when the rats will come out. You know when they that they are well fed, they're not breeding out of control, things are in control, just like the chipmunks, the squirrels, all the creatures on earth. That Some we think we're cute, some we don't. But ultimately, we all belong here and we all need to be true to who we are. And, you know, you're in law enforcement, but you're a performing artist as well, and we're all our own being. And what you do, I feel we all need this public service that we we all need to find a way. And I keep asking the city to form a Ventura Volunteer Community Corps to have us be, offer our time in whatever service, in whatever capacity we're capable, and let us be used and call us up and drag us out as necessary. But I feel this is the way we're going to go ahead. And so these crime reports, I would like to see us go deeper and deeper and see the results, not the, just the arrests, and, and we're seeing the symptoms. But let's keep working at the cause. Let's keep getting down to the bed and making sure we've got a healthy, fertile environment that we can all flourish. So that's, forgive me, but for going off on this tangent, but it, you know, it comes back to the dog and that incident that happened just the other night. I walked the dog off leash. I respect that every officer in this town just about it's the spirit of the law. It's the spirit of the law. If somebody is afraid, I carry a leash. I'm the one who wears the leash. I carry it so that the dog, if somebody's afraid, I will put them on the leash. But the dog, the leash is the communication we have. I have, he stays, he knows to stay. He knows, he looks, we're, we're as tethered as we could be with a, a physical leash, but much healthier and more complete. And I feel this is the law enforcement that we do. Let's find a way to do it this type of a way, I feel, because it, it opens everything up. Everybody becomes thank, and exposes Thank you, them. Trevor. Thank you thank very you. much. I think we're going to have to see if anyone else has questions before um, the police get whisked away to another Forgive me. Thank thing. you, guys. All right. Thank I'll be quiet. Again. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. It's police. Hello, 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 hi. Um, the dog barking in our community, it has taken over our peace, and um, and the uh, the dog uh, counts on when you call and nothing on the computer, nothing, and it's a uh, we have been waiting for over a year for that big dog on Walker and uh, Vine. The is the police dog. in any kind of connection to help us to speed this on? So I I miss to get rid of some big dogs that that are being locked up to uh, watch over some tools and barks real loud or till the night. N nobody cares. This is our community, and um, we have nothing in town to help us. So, you know, Camarillo is far away. Santa Rosa's Paula is far away. But who is helping him? I'm paying a lot of taxes. So I think that there's a lot of issues that have come up about dogs over this time that that uh, do require different approaches. So as far as the barking is concerned, uh, that's a separate issue. If If you suspect that somebody is mistreating their dog, and I was just picking up on little pieces as the car strode by. So correct me if I misunderstood something. But if, if we're ever worried about that, like an animal cruelty situation, please call us the police department and we will come. Yes, in that instance, animal cruelty, we will come out and we will investigate it and we will get animal control involved. I'm setting aside the barking dog for now. And I agree with Trevor that they... I, I can't give you e examples of really. Locking 
uh, locking up the dogs. It, it depends on the totality of all the circumstances. So that's a separate issue. And I'm, if you will let me, I, I'll, I'm going to try and answer it to the best of my abilities. So I'm our canine sergeant. I supervise the unit. So I, I tend to know quite a bit about the dogs and, you know, our dogs for a small period of time are in kind of a confined area in the car with the handler. And they're the best taking care of dogs on this planet. They're taking better, th better than me probably, but that's balanced with all the exercise and free time and interactions and uh, love from the, the handler that they're assigned to. So we have to investigate it before I could tell you, yes, a dog in a, in a cage is illegal. Like we have to look at the cage and does it have access to clean water and food? How long is it there? Things like that. So call us and we'll investigate it. And if it is cruelty, we will address it, period. And if it's not, then we'll call you back and explain like what it does have access to and that we can keep an eye on it together. As far as a barking dog is concerned, we contract with animal control and there's a different way to go about that, that it doesn't involve the police department. It involves getting signatures from neighbors and taking that to animal control. And animal control will determine if, if it's a nuisance dog or not and take steps to, to do it. Because with the tools that we have, uh, it's not the same as what they have to be able to evaluate if this dog is annoying or not. Now, if it's someone having a party and playing loud music, that's us, but dogs barking is animal control and their numbers on their website. You can, you can call, if you wanna talk to a dispatcher 24 seven, and it's not a 911 emergency, then it would be 805 six five zero eight zero one zero yep any other questions so just last comment for all of you that i think is kind of exciting because we haven't really had the resources uh, and time to to do it but i just did our first bike training in a long time uh on monday so we had six cops and we're going to be doing them all through june and we have our bikes all tuned up and we're putting them through the training to get out on bicycles. And they're going to be promenade downtown West main street bike path area, uh, during certain segments of the day to get out there and do that visible patrol where we can be keeping an eye out and more in touch with the community. If I drive by in a car, you know, I'm not going to have the same positive interactions just during the training. When we rode by, it was amazing. Cause everyone's like, hi, so good to see you out here. And it really deters things and gets a lot of that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So I think in the next couple of weeks, as we get more of the guys and gals trained, you'll be seeing them out and about on bicycles. So please say hi. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, Trevor Gotsman wanted us to ask about fireworks as well before you leave, officer. So every year those are an issue and every year we go full deployment. I'll be working 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So I'll be out here trying to help us manage our resources on 4th of July. In my opinion, it is, uh, and this is my opinion over the history of my career, it is the busiest night that I ever work and we get just flooded with more calls than you can imagine. So we bump our staffing up and we do everything that we can. That's obviously limited by the amount of cars we have, right? Um, and we will be doing proactive enforcement, but I would also expect that we're gonna be hearing fireworks and like we do every year, we are going to try and educate, hold accountable, prevent, stop and respond to everything that we can. Will we get it perfect and be at every single firework call with the resources we have available on that day? We're up for the challenge, so we'll try. Yes, so just for clarification, anytime you have an emergency, obviously 911, anytime it's a non-emergency, but you need a police officer to respond and it's not, it, it's that 805-650-8010. The only difference in who you speak to on that, on either 911 or that number I gave you is the priority in which they answer the call. So if both are ringing at the same time, 911 is gonna get answered first, and then they'll answer the other call as quickly as possible. But 
uh, call us. We're going to broadcast. We're going to respond whenever we can. And I'll personally be out here trying to do everything that I can to, to help make it as peaceful for everyone uh, out here as possible. Councilman? Sergeant Kelly, I believe I live not far from where Trevor lives. And my thing for the 4th of July, their um, fireworks sporadically, not every minute right now. But the whoever is shooting them off is laying them down sideways. So I'll get awakened at 2 a.m. by a firework, a bottle rocket or something exploding in front of my window. And further up where he lives close to the hill, we're hearing M80s or larger explosives. Sounds like dynamite sticks. And that's happening right now in our neighborhood. So, Yeah. Yeah, since Mother's Day. So I, I noticed it last week. We started getting calls and responding. Exactly. Okay. And and we have been my my team's issued a couple citations for it. We've taken the fireworks. Um so <clears throat> sometimes I get in trouble because I just speak openly if you guys re remember from when I was here before. But we're always trying to balance utilizing our resources the best we can. And frankly, sometimes these fireworks go off and I'm picture being in, in my shoes. I'm pulling up and there's literally dozens of people around and none of them are telling me who did the did the firework. So it's very helpful when you do call to give us some kind of description because if I pulled up in here because someone threw a firework and Amy is going to be pointing at everybody, right? And then everyone's pointing her and back and forth. And so it always helps when we have that description to try and figure out who's actually igniting them so that we can, sometimes we can do a social post citation if we know it's coming from a, a party where, where they're disturbing the neighborhood, and that's a very effective tool for us. Sometimes we're able to get the individual, but it all comes back to how quick we can get there, how good the description is, and, and if we can identify the person, which we always try to do, but the honest part is sometimes I show up and I have no, honestly, just no idea who is, who is doing it. So we try to talk to some people while knowing that the second you know, I walk away from my kid, they're going to put their hand back in the cookie jar, right? So we'll, if time allows, we'll wait down the street, we'll hunker down somewhere. But, but on those days, when I look at the screen and we clear, it's pages of fireworks calls. So we'll, we will, I promise, do everything we can. Um, please be patient with us and please give us the information to, to help our success in it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. It was good to see everybody. I was like, who's making the noise? And it was me. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Kelly. Appreciate that update. And uh, if you ever want to bring by the canines, uh, I won't be opposed to that if you ever want to bring them by one of our meetings. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Appreciate that. Next up, we have City of Ventura updates. First up, Councilmember Campos. Oh, or first up, our City Rep, Alejandra. Hello, everybody. My name is Alejandra, and I'm your comms liaison with the City of Ventura. I have a couple of updates here for you. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Those are the mic. Okay, how about now? So the city just launched uh, Ventura Voices, and this is a podcast where you can learn um, about your city and some news from folks that work daily. So we recently have uh, our police chief, Darren Schindler. Um, he talked a lot about safety and some insights. So I, we have our subscription link here. Uh, if you'd like to take a listen, we're on Spotify, YouTube, everywhere, and you can listen to us when... Uh, you're driving or taking a walk. Uh, X Games is returning to Ventura. And if you'd like to attend, we have a discount code here for you. If you'd like to buy tickets, it's a local discount code. It starts on June 28th through the 30th. And we have some updates on general plan. Uh, you will get a chance to review and provide input in our next draft at the end of June. You can visit planventura.com to stay updated. And uh, this is some news for 
us as ratepayers, Ventura Water Pure received $30 million um, in grants uh, to help offset Ventura Water Pure. We also have our latest Ventura Vibes community newsletter where you can sign up and read about all the news and all the updates that are happening in your city, any events or um, things pertinent to our community. Our next city council meeting starts at five on Tuesday, June 25th and Tuesday, uh, July 10th at 5 p.m. And there's one thing I wanted to share with everybody. This may be pertinent to um, the lady that asked about where how do we report um, real-time issues that are not emergencies? So we have a platform coming out called Ventura Connects, and this has been designed to enhance user experience, particularly on mobile devices, and it now offers real-time updates for a wide array of services and requests. So anywhere from potholes to graffiti to sidewalk repairs, public records requests, trees and overgrown vegetation, this new system will allow you to, on your phone, geotag a location and say, hey, this location has a pothole, uh, check it out. This sidewalk is broken, check it out. And you send a request to the city in this way. At this moment, uh, we're doing a very soft launch. It won't be available. Uh, it'll be available at the end of June, early July. Uh, this is just, a, I wanted to get the message out here to let you guys know that this is coming and this is going to be a new way that you can interact with your city government, let them know your thoughts and keep closely connected. You, um, and I'll come back next uh, community meeting and talk about the different features and how you can access them. And that is it from me, Marco. Thank you for having me. All right, next up we have Councilmember Campos. Okay, hello. Um, first, I'd like to say it looks a little thin here tonight, but for those who don't know, there's a um, big housing workshop or presentation going on right now from Community Development Department, I believe, about the arena numbers and how things are calculated and what's going on in the city with the um, housing element. And so I'm sure some of the people who aren't here are there. They may be on Zoom here and in person at the meeting there. I don't know for sure. Um, we had a long uh, city council meeting last night. One of the items was, which brought a lot of speakers, an hour and a half of speakers, was not specifically on the agenda. We were talking about the budget and it was a community organization, the Rubicon Theater asking for the city to fund them better and which was a beautiful ask but it was not timely we're too close to finishing the budget processes so there was little the city could do so you may see over the summer some um, pop-ups and exciting uh, events going on downtown to introduce the community to the rubicon so that they have better funding just from patronage. And next year we'll work on that if any of you are, are interested in that item. The other item was short-term vacation rentals, which council has been talking about for nine years, actively working on for eight years. Um, I believe it, it's been a goal for us for the last two years and for many councils before us the the decisions we made last night were stronger than others I've seen before, but it will still be a year before we have a proper, appropriate, well-regulated short-term vacation rental ordinance in place. I encourage anyone interested in any of the topics that you can find on the city council agenda to either come to the meetings and tell us what you think or come on WebEx or email us because the way your city council can make informed decisions is with the information you give us. And if there's any questions, I'll answer them.
Yeah, I was wondering if you had an update on the uh, progress of the McDonald's that wants to come into Stanley and the Avenue. So McDonald's is in the process, the application process um, to take over that property. And really legally, we can't do a lot to stop any business owner from um, going through the application process and making the effort to put a business anywhere they want in town if it's a available property. Our community development department has been looking at traffic studies, particularly the Avenue, Satakoy, uh, not Satakoy, Wells Road in Satakoy, which we are hoping to annex soon. And the length of Seaward as areas where drive throughs should be restricted because of the amount of traffic. I believe that restricting drive throughs may slow down the manner in which the McDonald's develops. But the, the key point or the key reason for that is because it's so close to Stanley Avenue that we already have traffic nightmares, as we know, all, on, all along Ventura Avenue. But that's one of our key locations for evacuation. It's a traffic nightmare in the morning when kids are being dropped off for school. Anytime there's an accident on Route 33, the flow of traffic along Ventura Avenue, particularly at Stanley, becomes dangerous. And so we're looking at the traffic to determine whether we're going to allow drive throughs on the avenue. And I think that will change the negotiation a little bit with McDonald's. Any others? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no drive throughs allowed, then they won't be able to put a drive through. They'll be able to put a restaurant, but not, not with a drive through. Um, the Burger King at Vons Plaza on Ventura Avenue has a drive through but it is fully contained in the parking lot. So whether or not it will stay or go with this regulation, we're not sure. They're not doing well, so they're talking about selling. If we complete the process of banning drive throughs on Ventura Avenue before the sale occurs, then there will be no drive through replacing it. And these are specific heavy traffic areas. Um, they won't be banned everywhere in the city. It will just be Seaward, Ventura Avenue, and Wells Road. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you, Councilmember Campos and Alejandra. Uh, next up, we have our treasurer's report. Uh, treasurer Zerbies is coming by. Looks like she brought a hat this time. Oh, I was going to replace it with a bike helmet, but. Uh... Hi. Oh, everybody's smiling. They know I'm the treasurer, right? Okay, right now, as of today, we have $928.47. We still got a lot of cents, but we need a few more to go in there. We do have our papers back there if you haven't signed up to be a member. But uh, I did have one today. Thank you. And um, we're looking forward to our, uh, what is it called? Our party, our our fiesta. So everybody hang in there because it's going to be a, a, a big one. And it's going to be over here on this street right here. Hmm? Oh, we haven't figured that one out yet. 
<laughs> Ask right, she, she's, she's, she's getting ahead. I had that at the end of the meeting. So we're working in partnership with WCDC uh, pending a grant from the city. They actually have a, a bigger grant allocation this year uh, that they approve. So hopefully uh, our two organizations get approved uh, for Fiesta again. But this time, instead of at Kellogg Park, it'll be uh, at Wall Street and it's going to be part uh repairing uh, or restoring the mural at Wall Street, uh, but it'll be basically Fiesta at Art Walk during Taco Week. I know we need to chop down that title a bit, but when Art Walk's happening, it'll be that weekend. Uh, so Saturday, September 21st. Uh, so save the date, Saturday, September 21st for this year's Fiesta. It's gonna be a big weekend between that, Art Walk, all sorts of stuff going on. And we got the hat that we're passing around. So if you have anything to spare for donation, please, uh, we greatly appreciate it. Next up, we have our GPAC report uh, and general public works update from Public Works Liaison and Secretary Freeman. Evening, everybody. Um, so real quick with GPAC, uh, we've been on uh, a break for a while. Uh, we were gonna do the circulation or traffic transportation element um, that's been put off. I don't know how many of you looked at the uh, the general plan land use map, but there are some issues with it. Um, it was very complicated and uh, there were some mistakes. So it's gonna be redone and it should be out this month and there'll be a new survey with that. So keep an eye out for that. And that land use is uh, basically where you can put houses, where you put businesses, it kind of goes along with zoning, but it's a little different. Um, there's that slide there. There's going to be a parking change uh, for the public parking lots in downtown on starting July 1st. Uh, the two lots with the red circles around them, that would be the ones behind the theater and the old, the one on Palm where the uh, farmer's market was. The one at the, behind the theater is going to go to 100% for hour. It's supposed to be marked really well, new signs and everything. And then the the one on Palm where the farmer's market, that's going to go to 50% uh, of that lot will be four-hour parking. So if you go downtown and you park, be aware that uh, there's going to be some changes. And hopefully the signs will let you know. Um, flags, I hope you all saw the flags got put up, I believe, last week. I was out of town. Um, so I want to thank everybody that helped with that. Trevor, who's online, helped a lot with storing and organizing them. Kay helped with repairing them. Um, the IBW put them up one night, all night. They were out all over town putting them up. And then uh, council member Duran was kind of the liaison and overseeing things for the city. And he helped us coordinate getting them up. And also, you'll probably, see, if you notice, there's going to be about 10 lights down the west side, down this end of the street that don't have uh, flags on them. They were purchased. They haven't come in yet. There's a delay for some reason. But talking to Council Member Duran last night, they uh, once they come in, we should get them up. So we'll have the whole street done. And then lastly, street lights that I keep promising you guys since last January of last year. <laughs> um, Edison said that they're waiting for delivery of the light. So I guess they're with the flags somewhere. Um, uh, they're supposed to be in this month and then they will be going in in uh, July sometime. And that's all I got. Any questions? Um, that some boulevards, they need turn signal. Um, so people don't, it's hazardous, you know, when there's not a turn light, especially mm -hmm. on Victoria and Walmart, that cross street, um, not alone, um, more across the boulevards, those flashing lights for the crosswalks and not, and even driving here, three kids on their bikes zigzagging the street doing wheelies it's just <laughs> unbelievable okay so the left turn thing we can send a suggestion to the traffic engineer for the city and um 
suggest that if you have any more specifics you want to give us that would be better that we can send to them um too bad you didn't bring it up about the bikes when the officer was here because um i hopefully the the bike patrols might help with that especially if they're downtown and the promenade i know along here too and then i have i agree the those flashing lights there is the city completed recently an active transportation plan and part of that is making streets friendlier for everybody including pedestrians so you'll probably start seeing more of those lights and not just the flashing ones i know on the other end of town by the big park on kimball they put in what they call a hawk light which is the ones that go over the street and flash so yeah i mean and i and i've spoken to commander Hurd, who's our usually officer that's here about even when those things are flashing and i've done it i'm standing on the curb i've got the light flashing and cars just blow by me so don't you know i agree i like crosswalks and flashing lights and i mean i can see those things for a quarter mile away but people still blow through them so don't don't trust that because the light's flashing somebody's going to stop So oh, I, everything you say, I, yeah, I, I understand. I agree with you. I've seen people just walk by, press the button and keep going. And, you know, you're driving at 25, 30 miles an hour someplace and you can't stop, but we all got to try and do what we can, I guess. And I'll pass those comments on to the traffic engineer and let him know. And hopefully our active transportation plan, you'll start seeing um, more and more around town where bike lanes, more pedestrian crossings and that kind of thing. Answer your question. Any others? Well, oh, thanks. Thank you, Pete. All right, next up we have our Revite Chair, uh, Whitehurst, to come give an update on what's going on in that committee. We had another lively meeting at the um, uh, fourth Wednesday of the month over at the um, WCDC office on Olive Street there. And um, uh, uh, someone brought up, wouldn't it be nice if we could green that strip of, of land in front of uh, Data School or De Anza School, um, plant some trees, community garden, that sort of thing. Uh, Liz Campos just uh, informed me that that belongs to the um, school district. And so uh, we're looking for ideas about what would you like to see there. So there, there's lots of possibilities, and it seems like it could be uh, better used without a whole lot of investment and um, make it more of a resource for the community. Currently, the um, data, the um, charter school there um, does uh, open its grounds to the neighborhood, you know, to come in and recreate and so on. Um, but if the, um, the principal of the school decides to close it, then that would not be available. And uh, as far as the environment, more trees are always nice. So if you have some ideas, you, know, you can give them to me and I'll uh, you know, put them in the, the records and then uh, come on down to the Rebike Committee meetings, 6, 6.30 to 8 on the fourth Wednesday of the month at the uh, Westside Development, um, what is it, Corporation yeah, Office over behind uh bonds there okay thanks much any questions come see me oh do you have any questions um someone hey. on zoom jennifer on zoom said get rid of the illegal street food vendor and then trevor also has his hand up okay 
Um, hi, Ron. Yes, thank you very much for doing all of this. Um, you know, I wanted to come to the Revite Committee meeting, but I couldn't make it. And I was trying to call WCDC, hoping I could even just sit on the telephone and sort of participate that mm -hmm. way. But if you need a Zoom account, if you need me to set up a meeting and something like that, let's mm -hmm. talk. I'll email you. And uh, But I'd like to, you know, if we could have the Revite also sort of a hybrid meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, for right now, I'm in this position. It's just it's the one way I can attend, you know. So uh, I'm offering you. I do have a professional one one professional account. I can set it up, and then we can start it up, and I can operate it remotely, and just um, give you the co the host ability to sort of do whatever, or I'll be the co host or whatever the case may be. Excellent. Uh, yeah, sounds like a great idea. Uh, we're always looking for more voices, and if uh, we can do a virtual meeting in combination with a face-to-face -face meeting, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we can set Excellent. up uh, using the same link that we have for our general meeting and just pop it open that day with a new recording. Uh, Trevor, yeah, if you ever uh, can't make a meeting in person, you can, uh, I don't know, the WCDC number, I didn't hear it. Did the phone go off that day? But you can call me directly or uh, Ron on the phone directly uh, during those meetings, and we'll go ahead and get you phoned in that way. But appreciate you uh, wanting to participate and look forward to seeing you at one of our future meetings. Good. Thank I'm going to have to put you in my phone. Cut it. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks, guys. As far as the uh, food vendor vendors on the street, that's a big issue, I guess, with the county. Um, the county health department, as I understand, regulates that. And so um i guess you know action item there would be uh when you see them on the street you could call um county uh health department and and you know register some kind of complaint okay yeah we've got a lot of people who are selling food on the street here we're the taco district after all and so uh, we want to you know, support our, our local businesses that are contributing to the community here. Great, thank you. Yeah, lots of exciting things happening there. I feel like, uh, yeah, that strip of uh, grass in front of De Anza, we can hopefully propose something to the school board, maybe start speaking at those meetings a bit. It'd probably just be an extension of the park that they already have. There's a pretty large space. So yeah, we'll keep working on that. If anyone else has suggestions, uh, please see Ron or myself. Uh, before we get on to uh, presentation, just quickly, we have a few announcements. If we could pull up those slides. Uh, we have first up our Parks and Rec uh, Commissioner, one of our representatives from the Parks and Rec Commission, Anthony Miller, uh, to share a few updates on what's going on there. Appreciate that. Hi there. Um, my name is Anthony Miller. I'm a Parks and Recreation Commissioner uh, for the City of Ventura, which is a volunteer commission that um, basically deals with all things Parks and Recreation in the city. So if there is anything that comes up in front of the Westside Community Council or is near and dear to your heart regarding Parks and Recreation, especially in this area, uh, our meetings are the second Wednesday of every month over at City Hall. It's uh, open to whomever wants to attend. I believe they start at four o'clock. Um, and they generally, so like generally, so generally speaking, we talk about all things Parks and Recreation related. So in terms of what we've got currently going on, uh, we've made an effort as a body to be as involved with city council as we possibly can. The commission serves as a representative body for the wider community to kind of be a conduit for parks and recreation issues to city council. So whatever ideas we hear from residents, uh, we try and crystallize for them so that way we can present them or forward them along to the city council because ultimately, Anything parks and recreation related is the, you know subject to the city's budget, subject to the city's programming, things along those lines. Um, so as you all might have seen or might know, there are some very large projects happening over on the west side here in regards to the bike trail and the skate park. Uh, those two projects did go in front of the Parks and Recreation Commission for presentation prior to their um, to their uh, groundbreaking. And it's a really good venue for anybody who wants to attend these meetings to also get uh, information as it comes up. And rather than kind of seeing it when you get off the freeway or seeing it after the fact, it's a nice way to get this information ahead of time. 
Um, so I just wanted to note real quick that in case there were questions, the area next to the skate park is currently being used as staging for the trail. So if you've seen heavy construction equipment there, that's not entirely related to the skate park. Well, actually, it's not related to the skate park at all. It's due to the trail work that's currently going on. And the skate park um, re, uh, renovation project is going to be occurring this summer with hopefully it going to be starting sometime in late summertime thereabouts. Um, so if you, like I said, if you'd like any more updates on parks and recreation business or if you have ideas and desires, um, please bring them to our meetings. We'd love to hear from the entire community. I am a West Side resident actually, so um, I like to hear from this sector of town, obviously. Uh, but we have represent uh, representation across the entire city. So if, uh, if there's an issue that's specific to the West Side, it doesn't necessarily matter. Bring it to the commission so that way everyone can hear it. Uh, and that's pretty much all I've got. So it's not, oh. Is, while he's getting the mic real quick, is there a way to um, contact the Parks and Rec Commission without going to a meeting? So I am not sure if we have a generic contact. I do know that our recreation department is, is our primary, um, our Parks and Recreation Division, I should say, is our primary point of contact for the commission. So Stephen DeFreitas is a good person to reach out to at the city. He's the recreation manager. And or Stacy Sarasua, which is the new, well, the brand new Parks and Recreation Department head. Um, she is also a good staff member to reach out to. And by reaching out to those staff members, you'll eventually get to us. Um, so, hi. <laughs> um, no, that's fa uh, fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah. your right just there we go. I'm no longer in the sea, I guess. <laughs> Ooh. All right. All right. Can I ask my question now? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned that you're from the West Side, which is great, which raises the question, are there are seven of you on the commission, one from each district? So the commissions are entirely volunteer based and they're not based on the, the council districts. So you can be a resident of any area of the city and uh, apply to be on the commission and the city council appoints the commissioners. Oh, OK, thank you. Okay. Tengo una pregunta. El, el, Keylo, el parque que tenemos aquí en el Keylos Park, es aquí. Uh, han puesto anuncios en el Next Door de que han encontrado jeringas y, y pipas en el piso. So, um, I have a question for you. Um, on Next Door website, um, they have put notices that Kellogg Park they found dirty syringes and drug pipes. Um, who's responsible in cleaning that up or who do we contact? So those are likely going to be uh, questions directed to the city's public works department, uh, and the, especially, specifically the parks division. Um, and, but beyond that, I don't wanna get too far into the details because I'm here representing the commission and I don't wanna speak out of turn, um, but that's about as far as I would say as terms of as a resident, I would go to the parks division for those kinds of issues. So who will be responsible in cleaning that up? If... Like, like I said, I'm, I'm here representing the commission right now on, on, on commission items, and I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, so, but as a, as a resident, I would say that I would generally call the public works department on their, on their uh, phone line or put in a service request via the website. Okay, okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much for that update. Maybe we add you to standing reports. No. Uh, when, oh, yeah. I mean, if you have an update every month, I don't know how frequent uh, some of these updates can be, but yeah, we can add you every month, every few months, whatever. Is that. Great. <laughs> Um, okay, next up, let's get the slides pulled up. I have a few announcements from WCDC and then uh, another one uh, from Rocio at the Merito Foundation. All right, so, okay, that I cannot help but laugh when I was looking at that back there. I don't know how she, okay. Anyway, uh, this weekend we got uh, a lot of events happening. <laughs> cannot. Okay, so we have Adopt a Block, which we have every second Saturday. Um, of the month, basically just going up and down the avenue, the different streets, uh, the avenue, sometimes uh, full street, sometimes just uh, up and down the avenue with little bit parts here and there. Uh, basically, 
uh, picking up trash. Uh, if you see any big items, uh, we also have a way to get rid of those as well through a partnership with Harrison. Um, so we meet at Two Trees uh, Church and then basically go and disperse amongst the avenue. Sometimes uh, teams will go to like Kellogg Park, for example. But basically, the more volunteers we have, the more parts and areas of the avenue that we can help uh, clean up uh, at least once a month through uh, this effort. Next slide. And simultaneously, uh, and we are running both of these events uh, concurrently. Uh, so WCDC is also hosting a free neighborhood cleanup event, uh, which I think either two or three are being done this year. Uh, we had one a few months ago. And so this Saturday, you can bring a number of items to throw out completely free of charge, basically everything except uh, hazardous materials. Um, so I've seen people bring mattresses. I think we filled like seven or eight of those giant Harrison uh, containers last time. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, so you can choose to uh, you know, help volunteer at both events or just participate uh, in throwing out some trash at this event. So they'll be running uh, concurrently, the adopt a block. Uh, I'll be starting at that from 9 to 11, 9 to 10 30 ish, a uh, good hour and a half, two hours there. And then uh, this three hour event, I'll go ahead and hop over there. Uh, you can help out with both or just do one. Appreciate any volunteers that we get. Um, but yeah, let your neighbors know. I know we handed out some flyers the other day to uh, some residents. Um, so yeah, it should be a good community event. Next slide. And then uh, Weave, uh, the Women's Economic Ventures, uh, is hosting uh, two events, the same event, but two different, uh, one in English, one in Spanish. Uh, also, at the same time, roughly uh, 10 to 1 this Saturday. Uh, yeah, that scheduling uh, is still happening. So if you want to come and uh, have a financial empowerment class and learn about uh, finances uh, through the Weave, uh, they'll have an English one. Uh, this Saturday, and then a week from Saturday, they'll have one in Spanish, both over at the WCDC office uh, at on Olive. So if you know anyone that'd be interested in that, please spread the word as well. Next slide. I believe, yep, now we'll have uh, Rocio from the Mary Toe Foundation come in on the same day, but later, so not as conflicting, come in. Uh, yeah, you can come up. Thank you, everyone. Um, and announced to drop by. Um, I'm here from the Merito Foundation. I'm the executive director. We're a nonprofit, environmental nonprofit that provide um, transformative experiences to youth to want to protect the ocean and everything, all environment. So we are working with Ojai Valley Land Conservancy to promote a forum for Spanish people, uh, Spanish speaking residents, uh, primarily from the west side of Ventura although it is open up to residents of the city as well, especially for people who um, have interest in Ventura River. Um, Ohio Land Conservancy has acquired 28 acres of land through a grant, which is in the Cañada Larga area, just north from what used to be the Brooks Institute of Photography. And that area floods consistently when we have heavy rains, the culvert or the drainage system doesn't work very well, and it's pretty impacted. So the Fordham, the purpose is for Spanish people, uh, residents, constituents, to provide us um, their opinion, their suggestions, their vision of what it should be like. It will be a low impact, um, like an environmental reserve. It's, it will have minimum infrastructure for the community to enjoy it for leisure, for educational purposes, for just like a, think about a big sand garden is what I envision, but everybody will have a different vision. So we're gonna have, it's gonna be very interactive. Starts at 12.30 PM on Saturday, also June 8th coming up in a few days. And it's um, right by the bus stop. So there is, I brought some flyers. I'm gonna leave them here. If you know anyone, if you can pass them over who speaks Spanish, who's from the west side of Ventura, if there will, there's gonna be interactive, um, the, the whole activities on how to provide your feedback, surveys, uh, interpretive hikes to the river or walks. It's, it's very easy in Spanish with guides, with binoculars. 
activities with children that will be led by Maribel from Bell Arts. And there's going to be a taco truck as well. So uh, as appreciation for the time and opinions and, and, and the community coming together. So we had a similar event here at Bell Arts on February 2023. And it was really, really nice to see the community come together and spend time talking about it, visualizing what, what would be. That forum was about the big picture for the whole river. This is very specific, but very tangible, and it's going to happen very, very soon. So please, I hope if you know, there will be another event in English also for the West Side that Overland Conservancy will organize in uh, September. No, actually, August. And then another one here in September at Bell Arts in Spanish again. Okay, any questions, just I'm right here. I'm Rocio, thank you. Oh, and in Castle Warm, at least, Campus will be our, our opening remarks. She will be there with us. Thank you so much. One last thing, because I didn't say the address. Sorry, in case those who are not here, I apologize. The address is 5721 North Ventura Avenue. Thank you for that. Lots of great events happening uh, on Saturday. Uh, also, uh, this Friday is First Friday here at Bell Arts. So uh, come to that as well. You know, going to be a great weekend here in the West Side community. Um, old business, just really quick. Um, we always just mention uh, the different city service requests, information, uh, hotlines. We have them all posted on our website, the pothole hotline we left on the agenda. Uh, in the future, we'll have a way to do that uh, online with the City Connect. Um, look forward to that. Uh, all right, let's get into the presentations. Now we're running a little bit late, but we're going to squeeze in these three presentations, all informational. Hopefully the information can get out there. Just you know, share it on YouTube for those that uh, couldn't make it tonight. First up, we have the Home Efficiency Incentives uh, presented by Juan Lottis. Lottis. <laughs> That's hoping to be floating in front of it. Uh, hello. Pull it up, pull it up. Oh, awesome. Awesome, well thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm here to talk about um, incentives that are available for folks. Primarily the main thing I wanna stress is it's either being a homeowner or sort of the decision maker in the home. I'll speak to um, some options for renters, uh, multifamily properties kind of quickly at the end. Um, but starting with this, I also do wanna point out um, that my phone number is located up here, Monday through Friday, nine to five, um, but you can call or text any questions. Hablo espanol, cualquier pregunta que tengan en los incentivos. Estoy aquí para ayudar a todos. So the program I'm primarily talking to everyone about is 3C Ren. Um, I work in partnership with them. It's the, and then I'll go to the next slide. Um, Tri County Regional Energy Network. Um, so it's three counties working together. Um, this is anything that's energy efficiency, is how I describe it. So that's everything for trainings for uh, building professionals, anyone who's an electrician, contractor. They offer a lot of educational resources on that end. Primarily, I'll be speaking to the incentives for households, um, anything that saves energy. Um, is going to be correlated with an incentive. I'll go into more detail shortly. And this program is funded by ratepayer dollars uh, that are then returned to the region. So it's a little byline on all of our utility bills. The state manages those funds and returns them to various regions for these uh, initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. A um, couple more details. There'll be a commercial program launching soon, which I'd love to share with folks. Uh, great for businesses who want to run their um, operations more efficiently. That's going to be coming in 2025. Agricultural operations and energy assurance. Those are all in the way. Details still to be kind of worked out, but definitely reach out uh, um, You know, later in the year. Reach out, and I'll have more info on that. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, speaking to the single family program, this is for um, houses one to four units. So if it's a little complex, that still qualifies for the single family uh, program. This can cover up to 75% of a project cost. There's variance within those incentives, but that's kind of the high end that we've seen. Um, almost any project that saves energy, gas or electricity is eligible. Um, full disclosure, I've seen folks contacting for windows. It's hard to find. Um, kind of the energy savings there. So things that are measurable, more so uh, technology or devices, insulation. Um, these incentives need to be contracted through, or uh, accessed through contractors who are enrolled in the program. 
that's part of the program design, making sure that they're licensed bonded. Um, but if someone you know or you have a contractor that you have a relationship with, they sign up, just kind of providing their information, making sure that they're in the system. You can work with anybody you're comfortable with. And the best way to describe it is the more energy you save, the greater the incentive amount. So the or I guess the less energy you're consuming post project. So energy correlated, um, that'll correlate with the incentives and not tied to solar. I get a lot of folks who start asking questions about solar. I do have resources and information regarding that uh, some of the other work I do, but not through this program. Next slide, please. So uh, this is speaking to the eligibility for the program. Uh, usually it's anyone who resides in the Tri-County region, um, but market rate incentives have been exhausted uh, just at the end of May. Um, so this is the general qualification, living in the three C rent territory, so San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, or Ventura counties. Receive investor-owned utility, which is most of us, SCE, SCG, CPA, anyone who is using our kind of traditional um, means of getting energy. Um, if you're off-grid, wouldn't qualify, but that's a rare occasion. And again, I always stress this multiple times, must be accessed through a contractor who's enrolled in the program. Um, and you must start the process of enrolling the program before implementing the project. I get a couple of folks who reach out and they're like, I did this two months ago. And unfortunately, uh, part of program design is showing that it did influence uh, decision making. Uh, this is what's gonna be current um, from now until this uh, remaining budget is expended. Folks must meet what is defined as hard to reach criteria. And I'll show what that is on the next slide. Oh yeah, sorry about that, thank you. Um, so in San Luis Obispo and San Lu uh, sorry, sorry, Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, uh, they only need to meet one of the criteria, which I'll, I get frustrated, Ventura, it's two of the criteria, but just going through it, mobile manufactured home, primary language other than English, uh, eligibility for care fair utility rates, or a member of a California Native American tribe. Uh, those are also going to apply to Ventura County, but there's uh, has to be two of those. Next slide, I'll show an additional option. So again, in Ventura County, um, singular activation of the hard to reach criteria would be a member of a California Native American tribe uh, or meeting any of those two previously mentioned criteria. Again, mobile home or pre-manufactured residence, primary language other than English, eligible for care fair discounted utility rates, which I recommend folks to look into. Um, that's available on whoever you pay your utility through. Definitely worth taking a look at the application. That's great for everyone to take a look at. Um, and live in an SB 535 DOT community. That's the additional element that any combination of these two will work for. On this right-hand side, I have a map. As you can see, the left-hand side of the avenue or the west side of the avenue and kind of cutting through a little bit below, that would be... Uh, area that qualifies in conjunction with any of these other qualifying factors. All right, again, just kind of general pictures. If it saves energy, it qualifies for the program. Yeah, we can skip it. I mean, yeah. Uh, so these incentives do stack. And the biggest thing that I will stress here, the stacking that is most notable is gonna be for heat pump technologies. So that's converting from gas heater, gas water heater, to a heat pump um, water heater or HVAC system. The, um, some of the funds are, exp or funds are expended for the heat pump water heaters, but I'll go into detail on that on a uh, later slide. And then next slide, please. Yeah. Oh yeah, so what do I mean by stacking? Um, so that means Tech Clean California is gonna be our state level program incentive. And again, the values that I'm speaking to here are for folks who qualify for, um, normally it's that care fair qualification would be the uh, incentive boost. So I am working off of those numbers, but it's gonna be $1,000 or $2,000, which through the state level program, $9,000 is the average 3C rent HVAC incentive, which again, I tell folks that the range can be broad. Like if you're very light use of your gas heater not necessarily going to see that, so it's something that's going to cut down dramatically on use. And then the last one is at the federal level, and that's going to be a $2,000 tax credit, which is end of year, submitting your tax forms. That's going to be uh, knocked off of your tax liability. And the next incentive, or next slide. Just a quick overview of what Tech Clean California is. Again, fun, uh, heat pump water heater funds are exhausted um, through 
2024. There will be a little bit more being released later this year, but I don't have enough details. And I don't work closely with them to speak to that. But again, my contact information is there for future reference. Again, access through po program enrolled contractors. That's the biggest takeaway that for anybody, for a lot of these programs, you have to work with someone who's enrolled so you don't miss out on that money. Next slide, please. And then heat pump incentives from tech. Uh, this is for market rate is gonna be $1,000. It's $2,000 for folks who uh, qualify for those additional um, incent or enhanced incentives. And any electrical panel upgrade in conjunction with heat pump technologies will qualify for a $2,000 incentive. And then next slide, please. This is just how to participate. So say that you're a market rate customer, you're not able to qualify for the 3C REN program currently. This is the state level program. Again, not for heat pump, or not for water heaters, but if you're looking at an HVAC system, uh, this is gonna be switcheson.org. Um, go there, you can take a look. Uh, SwitchesOn also has other resources for various combinations of device specific incentives. Um, so take a look there if that interests you. Next slide, please. And this is kind of, we kind of looked at that on that previous slide, um, but this is what we're looking at, average incentives for these uh, enhanced incentives for hard to reach communities or individuals. So heat pump, looking about $9,000, but big variance. I stress that more than anything. I don't want folks to be disappointed or tell me I was a liar. Um, water heater, about $3,000. And in 2023, this is why I say there's a huge range. Uh, market rate folks were receiving anywhere between $500 and $5,000 really depends on your project and your current energy use. I was like, who's back there? No, um, and this is just kind of giving folks a little bit of information on the federal level incentives. Uh, so this is the Inflation Reduction Act, available now, federal tax credits that you'll file end of year. It's a 25C is generally the form that folks are looking at. And this is something, oh, sorry, back one. I'm just going to get folks. And this is what I want folks to sort of think about and, you know, of course, get it done as soon as you can, but think about waiting. Um, $4,000 is going to be available to folks who land between 80 to 150% of AMI. $8,000 is going to be available to folks who fall below that. And those incentives are going to be available um, through Kira. It's the Home Efficiency Energy Reduction Act. I apologize, so many acronyms that I'm trying to navigate. Um, but those incentives are going to be available closer to the fall, maybe even as soon as August, September. So if you're kind of on the fence or want to look at that and you do qualify for that range, definitely worth waiting for and reaching out to uh, myself or filling out an interest form. Next slide, please. I know. <laughs> They'll be quick, they'll be quick. We'll get you out of here. And then energy efficient, again, 30%, kind of a review, and then we'll skip this one, kind of more what I was speaking to, but lined out for folks to look at after. Or next. And then we can kind of skip this one. Again, uh, looking at those values on a heat pump water heater, 3,000 plus tax credit, missing on at state level. Keep going, again, it's kind of, dipping down for market rate. And this is how it compares to what's available, $2,000 from the state, 9,000. And here's how to keep track of these. There are two incentive vendors available, Switches On, which is the state level uh, managed program, and then 3C REN has their own. Also, you can reach out to me, um, help you with incentives, understanding tax credits, connecting with enrolled contractors. And we're also keeping an eye on any future uh, rebates or incentives that are available this is stuff that's down the pipeline for solar, some EV stuff. I don't work as closely with that, but can definitely refer folks to resources there and charging and e-bike programs that I've heard are kind of in the pipeline. And then next slide, please. And then this is a quick uh, little update for folks who are renters. There's the Home Energy Savings Toolkit and the Induction Cooktops. Both are available within the library system. I took a look. There's not currently one at the uh, Avenue location, but if you request it, they can transfer. It's actually, I saw it was like in process of transfer. Uh, again, also for renters, if you are income qualified, I recommend folks to look at uh, CareFera qualifications. And then following that, if you qualify for CareFera and need some weatherization measures, 
Uh, there's Community Action Partnership, or CAVC, which offers uh, free weatherization uh, support. Uh, next slide, please. And this one I just throw on there. Uh, this is for five plus unit buildings, anyone who might be a multifamily property owner. They also have a multifamily program, which they take a look at energy improvements. That's all free, you can kind of at least get an analysis of the building. Then if folks decide to follow through on a project, there's per device incentives and per unit incentives available. Next slide, please. And then if you want to get started, I always throw this on, make it easy, left side for an interest form for the QR code. If you have additional questions, um, this is through my work with the Community Environmental Council. This will kind of put you into the conversation support pipeline. So this is getting started and this is kind of asking questions and getting more support for myself. And then last slide. And then thank you very much for having me this evening, uh, your patience and questions. Again, email is located up there, and if you'd like, you can call or text, again, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And question from you? At the library, Foster Library, we rented, we actually didn't rent, I said, take it out like a book, and an a, uh, induction stovetop, and we loved it so much, we have two of them now. Really? But you can take out like a book for two weeks, try it out. And we have two refrigerator magnets, 3C REN, which yeah, you put yeah. in because you've got to test all your cookware to make sure it has a magnetic bottom on it. I want to know, second question, what does 3CN stand for? Uh, the Tri-County Regional Energy Network. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I just wanted to add on that. We have them sitting on top of our gas stove, and the only time we move them off is when I have to make a really big baking thing. It works beautifully. Awesome. Yeah, the, there's very little heat coming off in the kitchen when you're cooking because they're so efficient. Yeah, which is and great, too, uh, and you turn them off, and then it's like cools off. Almost, and yeah. they heat, they boil water faster. Everything is much better. Lists or questions? Oh, yes, thank you. So flyers are available at the back if anyone wants to grab any. Uh, English on one side, Spanish on the other. Um, definitely please grab those or share those with anyone who may benefit from the program. Cur currently, yeah, yes, at, at this point in time, um, that's what's available or the remaining budget. Uh, generally, the program's available to any tri-county uh, resident who's a decision maker for the home. But yeah, from now through the end of the year, it's going to be for folks that meet those qualifying factors. No, I was just going to, because if we don't use the mics, they can't hear on Zoom. So I was just going to repeat your question. Um, so if you just want to repeat it for the my question was to clarify that as of now, the incentives are available only to hard to reach uh, classification. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Folks who meet uh, in San Luis Obispo or Santa Barbara County is one of those additional qualifying factors. And in Ventura County, two of the qualifying factors, which would be living in a mobile home or, or li it's two. So two of these is, but I'm going to say, or living in a mobile home, uh, being a care fair qualified utility um, subscriber. Uh, speaking the language not uh, other than English primarily in the home or being located in uh, kind of that little region that I showed, the west side of the avenue or kind of cutting down. Um, and the last qualifying factor, which was recently clarified, was being a member of a California um, Native American tribe. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate all that. Uh, sounds like we'll have to have you back uh, January 2025 so we can get to the beginning of the year. <laughs> all right, moving right along, we have the California Rural Legal Assistance Group. Uh, both of their representatives uh, are participating via Zoom. We have Evelyn Curiel and Melissa Vergara. Yes, hello. All right, going to go ahead and hand it over to you. I know uh, you sent over the PowerPoint in advance. You want us to share it on our side? Or do you yeah, okay. All right, Helen, go ahead and put up the... PowerPoint and we'll let them take over. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So um, we're here for CRLA. We will be presenting today. My name is Melissa Vergara. I'm a community worker. And we also have here my coworker, um, Evelyn Gurian, which is an attorney for our office. And so we'll start off by saying, so we stand by, we've been fighting for justice, changing lives since 1966. Okay, so um, so who are we? So CRLA stands for California Rural Legal Assistance. So we're a statewide nonprofit law firm for low-income residents. It was founded by a group of individuals that included um, activist Cesar Chavez. There's 18 offices throughout California, and then our services are made possible by federal, state, and private funds. Um, so I'm Evelyn, and like Melissa said, uh, we are going to be presenting to you general information. So this is just a disclaimer that the presentation being offered is solely for the purpose of providing general information. It does not qualify as legal advice. If you do need specific assistance or do have specific questions about something that you are personally experiencing, you are more than welcome to contact us or uh, we will at the end have our contact information if you would like to contact our office. Okay, so we, as we mentioned, um, have 18 offices um, throughout California. And this is a map of the different offices that we have. And then we have an image on the right side with um, our office, which is in Oxnard. Um, and we are located on A Street. So we have different levels of services. What can we do for you? So there's, it starts from as low as referrals um, and it goes all the way up to legal representation, whether that is brief or in extended. Um, we also have different manners of assessing what level of service we are able to provide to you. Um, the one thing we can guarantee to everybody is at minimum a referral and general information for their specific concern. And then at most, depending on how much assistance they need, uh, we are able to offer full representation for them, uh, whether that's through appeal, a court hearing, or um, assisting them with their concerns. All of our services are free. So if you qualify as our client, it is free of cost. And we specialize in different service areas. Our priority service areas would be um, housing, for housing, education, employment, and public benefits. So within housing, as Melissa mentioned, we do fair housing, evictions, foreclosures, tenant rights, tenant rights within private um, landlords and different types include employer provided housing, farm labor camps, public housing subsidized or Section 8 vouchers as well. And we do have a separate line for private landlords. Um, you can call our direct hotline, which is for private landlord representation or concerns. Otherwise, um, the Oxnard office number at the end will also qualify for the rest of the types of housing concerns. And we also uh, assist with labor and employment. Um, some of the areas uh, that we prioritize are on unpaid wages and overtime, working conditions, employee rights, discrimination, retaliation, and health and safety violations. Within public benefits, uh, we assist with unemployment, identification, clearing matters, denials or appeals with unemployment, 
assistance with SSI, appeals and overpayments. An example of something we are able to assist with is wrongful denials of food stamps, cash aid, Medi-Cal, et cetera. So if you do have any concerns with public benefits, um, you are more than welcome to contact our office for assistance. We also assist in education matters uh, for K-12. to And some of the areas that are included are alternative school transfers, school discipline, including suspensions and expulsions. So we ensure that whenever a student is suspended or expelled, that the, the law was followed and that all the steps that need to proceed in order for this to happen are followed. And then we also assist with language access issues and then LGBTQ plus student rights as well as special education pl placement programs for students. Some additional services that we have include record clearing, so removals of crimes, reduction of serious crimes, sealing of an arrest warrant, early termination of probation, certificates of rehabilitation and waivers. And you are able to call that direct program through the direct line, which is 805-902-2752. We also assist with medical debt, name and gender marker changes and immigration. And okay, um, so we're going to touch upon a little bit on tenant rights. So this slide was supposed to be a video, but I don't think it's functioning so we'll go ahead and just go on to the next slide and then so we want to discuss uh who's considered a tenant so a tenant is a person who rents an apartment house room or other place to live um so anyone that rents and then leases can be verbal or in writing and then um there's different types of leases and they're all valid. There's one to, uh, one year to six month leases, month to month leases. And then um, there's a Santa Barbara uh, ordinance that residents of Santa Barbara have the right to request a year lease. So quickly, um, know your rights for paying your rent. Um, so there is a three-day ability to pay your rent. So on the third day, you're able to pay it without any fines. They cannot charge you any late fees. After that third day, they are able to charge you whatever late fees are reasonable. Usually that amount will be notated in your lease. So I would take a look at that. Um, you have a right to a paper receipt. So when you pay your rent, you can request some type of documentation. Um, if you do not receive a receipt every time you pay your rent, maybe it's on a portal, just make sure that it is on the ledger. And you also have a right to request a ledger at any point throughout your residency there. Um, further, if they're unwilling to give you a paper receipt, you can also follow up with a text or an email to the landlord, just verifying where your rent is and it was paid on what day, what was the amount and for what month. So you do want to detail that on a check or a money order for what month you are paying rent. Um, you do have the right to pay in cash or with the money order as well as a check or some people choose to do direct deposit. That is fine as well. You can pay also with your bank account directly. Uh, this will also verify that you have some form of record. And as I said previously, a text message will be sufficient as documentation of something in writing for confirmation of payment. Um, one question that we had for you before finishing up, um, if it was the end of the month and you received an eviction letter, your landlord says that if you are not out by the 31st of that month, they will call the police department to take you out. Is this lawful or accurate? I 
that's say no. We say no. Okay. Um, so no one is <laughs> jumping in. So it is technically unlawful and inaccurate as well. Um, when you receive any type of notice in writing, it is only a notice of a termination. In order for a landlord to take any action, they are required to go through the unlawful detainer process, which is through the court of Ventura. Um, if you are in Ventura County, it would be through the Ventura court. It would have to be filed, and then you would get the opportunity to have your day in court. It is upon losing that unlawful detainer case that they would then be able to issue a sheriff's lockout. Um, before that point, the landlord is not able to take any means into their hands and they're not able to do any type of self lockout or any changes. Um, they're also not able to threaten, which we have seen for them to lock you out prior to the official unlawful detainer eviction process. Okay, um, so that would be the end of our presentation. Again, my name is Melissa Braga, and I'm a community worker, and we have Evelyn Gurian, which is our staff attorney. And then if you need to contact us or you have any questions, um, you can call us to 805-483-8083, and we are located on 338 South A Street um, in Oxnard. Um, and we just wanted to know now if um, anybody had any questions. No questions in the audience. I don't think I see any on this either. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, let's give him a round of a hand. Okay. All right. Uh, well, one more presentation, last but not least. We're actually kind of catching back up on uh, being on time today. We have uh, Amy Dugan from the Ventura County Behavioral Health. Uh, she's here last year, but in a different capacity. So I'll let her introduce herself and what she's going to go over today. You know, this has been a full agenda and everyone is very tired. So I promise this will be as quite brief. Um, let me just get Great, terrific. Um, so uh, tonight is a little bit, my name is Amy Dugan again. Um, I'm a consultant for Ventura County Behavioral Health helping with their overdose prevention project. And tonight is a little different than when I was here a year or so ago because it's more specific to a harm reduction tool that we are introducing into the community, fentanyl test strips. So um, you can go to the next one, thank you. So um, fatal drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in our nation. And as we can see, uh, fentanyl, which is the orange, uh, is contributing to a lot of our fatal local overdoses. Next slide, please. Most everyone these days is pretty familiar with what fentanyl is. Um, it is touching pretty much everyone, but for those a little less familiar, it's a synthetic or man-made opioid. It's a hundred times stronger than morphine and just a tiny, tiny amount. The tip of that pencil, just a few grains, only two milligrams can be a lethal dose. I like to hold up this pencil. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the board here. Okay. Um, you know, you see it enlarged there, but we're talking about just the tip of this pencil. Just a few grains are enough to be a lethal dose. It's highly, highly potent, highly, highly addictive. It's very cheap to produce. It really stretches a drug supply and um, it's a huge harm in our community. It was developed as a prescription where it was regulated or is regulated still as, as a prescription 
and medically supervised, but we're now seeing a huge surge in illegal or illicit fentanyl. And it's mixed into other drugs, again, very easily. Drugs that can be snorted, injected, um, swallowed. Drugs like heroin, benzodiazepines like Xanax, cocaine, methamphetamine, and ecstasy. We're really starting to see a rise in it mixed with meth um, that is becoming more common. And has anyone here heard of xylazine or zombie drug? It's an animal, thank you. <laughs> it's an animal tranquilizer and fentanyl is being mixed with that. And that has started showing up in our community as well. So highly, highly dangerous. Um, it's often disguised in counterfeit or fake pills. So if you look at those two images, most people will think that the one on, I guess it would be your left, uh, is the fake pill because it doesn't, you know, you don't see the M quite as well. It doesn't seem like it's pressed quite as professionally, but that's actually the real pill. The other one is the fake pill. So those making counterfeit fake pills are highly, highly skilled, but it's being done in, in clandestine environments. So it's in, you know, in a smoothie mixer, drugs are being mixed up. There are no precise doses for the fentanyl that's being added to drug supplies. We need to assume that fentanyl is in every illicit drug right now. It is that prevalent. The uh, Drug Enforcement Administration in 2023, they seized 78 million fentanyl-laced pills. 12,000 pounds of fentanyl powder. That equates to uh, about 388 million lethal doses of fentanyl, enough to kill everyone in the United States. So this is, this is really a, a huge issue we're seeing. Next slide, please. So in terms of harm reduction, harm reduction is really important because, well, I'll, I'll start with just the goal behind it. It's to reduce any risk. So when you're having this conversation in the community and, and maybe you get a little pushback for, for fentanyl test strips or, or harm reduction tools like this, it's important to note that wearing a seatbelt, that's harm reduction. Wearing a helmet, taking medication for your diabetes, um, designating a sober driver. Those are all harm reduction tools. Now with substance use, we're acknowledging that illicit drug use is happening. And as a result, we need to address the harms associated with it. We are, we are acknowledging again risk, that people engage in risky behavior and trying to figure out ways to help combat that. So in terms of substance use, it's really focusing on improving people's health, well-being, and their safety, people who are using drugs. And it's a very practical and compassionate, more socially just approach to minimize harm. It's really meeting people where they are, respecting their autonomy, and then also empowering them to try to make healthier choices. And oftentimes when you can have these conversations, acknowledging where someone is and also providing some tools and some resources, it really can bring them closer to care and potentially closer to treatment. It's an evidence-based prevention strategy, and it also helps really normalize an issue that is touching pretty much everyone or most everyone these days on, on some level and um, helps disseminate some of the myths around around drug use and, um, and then also, uh, you know, some of the stigma, it really shifts outcomes. It is shown that strategies like this are reducing overdose and unintentional poisoning and ultimately saving lives. Next slide, please. So again, um, our latest approach is bringing fentanyl test strips like this into our community. And um, I know for those on Zoom, I, it's a little harder to see this, but um, they are, so this is the test kit, single, single use, and it is a test strip. 
sort of like a COVID test. We're all very accustomed to those now. And they are used to test any substance, anything drug that's going to be consumed for fentanyl. It can be in various forms, in a pill form, a powder form, or an injectable fentanyl that may be mixed with cocaine, meth, or heroin. It will tell you if fentanyl is in your drug, but it won't tell you how much or how potent it may be. So if it identifies fentanyl is in there, it can very well be a lethal dose. And if these strips are used correctly and the instructions are, are quite clear, um, of course there can be human error, but um, if they are used correctly, it really helps to substantially reduce the risk when, when individuals are, are consuming drugs. And having these, using these, are protected by the Good Samaritan Law, just like using naloxone or Narcan, which I'll introduce in just a moment. Next slide, please. So how effective, what are, what are we seeing? Um, for people who use drugs and also use fentanyl test strips to test their drugs, and if they get a positive result indicating that fentanyl is present, oftentimes people will throw away their drugs. They will not consume them. If they do, they might reduce the dose. They might go slower in, in consuming those drugs. They might do a tester shot. They're more apt if they're already going to lengths to test their drugs to know that it's important not to use alone. That always increases the risk of overdose if there's no one there to, to help. Uh, they'll often have test strips in conjunction with Narcan or Naloxone. And we'll go over that just a little bit. Um, and uh, studies have shown that those who are using using drugs and also testing their drugs with fentanyl test strips are more apt to give fentanyl test strips to those who are at risk as well. So to pass those on to friends, often they're our, our biggest source of distribution of fentanyl test strips are those actually using them. And there is no, for, for those who, who may push back a little on the idea of these, there's no empirical evidence that fentanyl test strip use result in increased drug use among those who are using. And it's unlikely that just having these available are going to promote someone's drug initiation. So um, really important to note those things. Next slide, please. So um, again, a little hard for those on Zoom, but just by way of example, um, the examples are back on the back of these test strips. And I will have these available after, after the presentation or after the end of the meeting uh, for anyone interested. Um, but for example, if you had a, a, a pill that you got from a source, you're not quite sure, you want to know if there's fentanyl in that, you need to, you need to break up that entire pill. You want to be able to test the in, entire product that's going to be consumed. So in a moment, I'll show you a different slide, but you, it's helpful to think of a pill, a potentially counterfeit fentanyl-laced pill, like a chocolate chip cookie. If you're making a batch of cookies, you can't really control how many chocolate chips show up in each cookie. It's the same with fentanyl that's, that's being laced into, into counterfeit pills. Part of that pill might not have any fentanyl at all. Another part might have enough to kill you in that one pill. So you break up that pill, you, you mix it all up together to really distribute the fentanyl if it's potentially in there. Then the second part of this test strip has a little scooper. And again, you can't see it, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny. You, you test some of your product up to from minimum of five scoops to 10 scoops. And that's a very small amount, but you've mixed it all up. So there's even distribution of potential fentanyl. Whoops. Then you fill up, this is a vi this can serve as a vial. You fill it up with water, the same amount of water. It, it's numbered per scoop. So if you put in five or seven scoops, you're going to fill it to the seven with water. Stir it up a little, put the test strip in there. Leave it in there for 10 seconds, 
take that strip out, lay it flat on a non-absorbent surface, and then in five minutes, check it. Now, in terms of the results, for those of us who have been doing COVID tests for a while, it's a little counterintuitive because one line is positive for fentanyl, two lines, no fentanyl. So that's the only thing you kind of have to reprogram your brain. Next slide, please. So again, that image up there just brings home the point about chocolate chip cookies, that analogy being much like what we're seeing in counterfeit pills. So just some takeaways. It's best to test the entire supply, everything you intend to consume. Never use alone. Take turns if needed. Use a buddy system. Make sure someone is alert and checks on you. Definitely avoid mixing drugs. That is a recipe for overdose, including alcohol. Always carry naloxone. So naloxone is a safe and legal antidote for an opioid overdose. It's a nasal spray, and I have this available today as well for those who may be interested. And the thing about naloxone, which is so important, one, it only works if it's an opioid overdose. So if someone is overdosing on stimulants alone and no fentanyl, no opioid is involved, it will not work. However, it is not harmful if it's administered by mistake. So when someone sees someone, believes they may be overdosing, first call 911. Always call 911. We again have the Good Samaritan Law. We want to encourage saving lives. Then you're looking for potential signs of an overdose. Opioids, opioid overdose, telltale sign someone's pupils are very tiny. They're going to be unresponsive, probably unable to talk. You're going to do a sternum rub or something to kind of try to bring them out of it, and that's not going to work. Um, their breathing may be incredibly slow, or they may have stopped breathing altogether. Their lips, their nails, their skin might look kind of bluish or pale, and they may also be making kind of some gurgling or snoring type noses, noises and be very slumped over. So all, all signs to look out for if someone is, is using opioids. Next slide, please. Um, again, we have test strips and naloxone available. There are some uh, materials on the table as well where you can get this information, uh, as well as scanning that provides where you can get test strips, naloxone, or syringe replacement in our community. And um, one more slide, please. And then in terms of, of some help, some treatment, if someone you care about or if you might be struggling with addiction, which is a disease, help is a call away. That is our access line available 24 seven. And um, there are also some cards there with safe choices, um, some resources throughout the community, uh, through the county. And um, I am available for any questions. And also we'll stick around afterward if anyone would like uh, any of these resources. Thank you. Things on Zoom? No, oh, okay. Tried to be brief. <laughs> I know it's been a long night. Yeah, we're actually going to end on time since technically at 6 30 to 8 30. Uh, appreciate all the presentations, updates tonight. Um, again, uh, please share. This will be posted on our YouTube shortly, a few days uh, or so. And so if anyone you know uh, could benefit from this information, please help spread the word. Um, we did our announcements earlier. No other new business. Open comment period if anyone has anything else they want to say. Nope. Okay, great. Uh, just a reminder, or I guess not a reminder because last year it was August. We're actually going dark in July this year. So happy 4th of July, everyone. We'll see you guys in August for our next general meeting, August Wednesday, August 7th at 630. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned.